Back in February of this year, our community was rocked by allegations of sexual harassment against a regular guest and minority partner on our show. It was conservatively the billionth time a prominent man in the movement was credibly accused of similar behavior. But somehow it was the first time that many people in our direct community, myself included, really realized that it could happen here too. Well, in the wake of that situation, an organic movement started among listeners to our shows and the shows that constitute our broader podcast family to try to put something in place to maybe do something about the billion and first similar accusation. After a lot of time and effort from some very dedicated volunteers, a group started to emerge from that effort called the Creator Accountability Network. And to tell us more about that, I'm excited to welcome the group's most indefatigable volunteer and its executive director, Sarah Tuline. Sarah, welcome to the show. Hi, Noah. Thanks so much for having me. I've really been looking forward to this interview for a long time. So first of all, on behalf of myself and the whole Piot family, thank you so much for all that you and the other volunteers have been doing behind the scenes on this thing for the last seven months. Absolutely. This is something that every one of us is deeply passionate about. And together, we've been riding that wave of energy to accomplish everything that we've done so far. All right. So in your own words, what is the Creator Accountability Network? So the Creator Accountability Network is our response to a problem being faced in most communities who have struggled to address harmful and unethical behavior. Without like oversight, community members have been forced to rely on whisper networks or kind of like the court of public opinion to get issues resolved or even heard. And we've witnessed harm fester and grow. People become ostracized or leave the community and entire communities are very negatively impacted. So in the hopes of creating a better mechanism for addressing problems like this, a couple of groups of volunteers came together to form a nonprofit dedicated to empowering community members and content creators to foster healthier and safer communities. And we plan to do that by coming at the problems from a few different angles. So proactively, we're seeking to prevent harmful behavior through an ethical training and accreditation program that we've developed for content creators, wherein they also sign an agreement to uphold a code of conduct that's been created by our ethics team. More on that later. When harm does occur, we will have a victim-centered reporting system for community members to report unethical or harmful behaviors to. After that behavior is reported and investigated, and we know as many facts as are available, We plan to engage in a restorative process that focuses on healing through active accountability. All right. So what are the groups? We'll we'll talk a little bit about the long-term vision in a moment. What are the group's immediate goals? So in the short term, we would like to begin training and accrediting content creators and having them sign on to that code of conduct within a month or two. Sometime this winter, we would like to be ready to start taking and investigating reports from community members. How fast we can actually do that really depends on whether we get the volunteer response that we need and are able to fill some key positions sooner rather than later. So one of our program leads, Justin Woodruff, very suddenly and tragically passed away this summer. I'm so sorry to hear that. They were a wonderful person, an amazing team member, and were so valuable. They were so thoughtful and so well-suited for their role. Filling their shoes feels like a really tall order. But we're at the point in our development where it's a necessity. So once we find the right volunteers, you know, the timeline for when we'll be able to launch each program should be more clear. And then we'll have more announcements for the community and be able to kind of open each program on its own. Okay. So, you know, obviously we're still in our infancy here. We're, you know, the the group is still looking for for key volunteers, as you said. But I'm curious how this is all going to work, right? Like, so you say that, you know, you're going to investigate, get all the facts available and engage in restorative justice. Like how, how? So there are two sides to this equation. There's what we do for content creators and there's what we do for members of their communities and then how those two things essentially make possible what we are hoping to do. So for accredited creators who are accredited with us, sign up with us, We will provide a code of conduct that creators will agree to uphold and promote and provide training to ensure that they fully understand those standards and have opportunities to ask questions and raise concerns. Essentially, if they're going to agree to meet and uphold this code of conduct, we want them to understand it inside and out 
and have very little doubt as to what they're signing on to. Mm. We will investigate reports of violations of that code by creators using restorative justice practices. That involves engagement with both the accuser and the accused so that you are getting both sides of a story. You are finding, you know, are there bystanders? Are there screenshots? Things like that. But all that information is gathered at the same time through an investigation process as opposed to coming out whenever people post it in Facebook group. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's just the thing is that it's generally speaking going, I, I would assume in, in, in most instances, except, you know, the most heinous of them, it's going to be in everyone's best interest for some sort of organized investigation to be leading the way there. Yeah. yeah we have all the facts together before, you know, any steps are taken whatsoever. And then we'll address any substantiated violations using restorative justice approaches that prioritize education, facilitated communication. So there might need to be like some communication between the person who made the report, but the organization can facilitate that communication through writing, I think is my preference, and then through restorative agreements and ways that we're figuring out how do we resolve this, how do we repair any harm that was done, things like that. So now when you say restorative justice, is that, is that that's like opposed to uh, punitive justice? Or uh, can you speak a little bit more about what, what you mean by that? I can. I'm going to take a little detour to do it, though, because that's the original question was like, how is this going to work? Mm -hmm. And so we're still looking at just the accredited creator side of things. And then there's a whole other side for community members wishing to report violations. Oh, okay. So, so sorry, I, I I jumped ahead of you on that. Then, if if you would just go ahead and continue with your answer there, and then I'll I'll uh, give you the restorative justice okay. cue in a in, in in a minute. Um. So, you know, that's what we're doing for the creators' side of thing, and they're kind of like one side of the coin. And the other side of things is the reporting system for community members who want to report, like, hey, I think that this content creator did something that violates their code of conduct. We will provide a secure reporting system through our website where anyone can report potential violations of our code of conduct. So they don't need to be sure. They can make a report even if they are like, maybe it violates it because we can look into it and do our fact finding afterwards. Mm -hmm. We'll provide certified victim advocates to help community members understand all of the potential outcomes of making that report so that they can make informed decisions that are in their own best interest. We will connect people making reports to services in their area if they need that. So if they need legal services, if they need to find a local victim advocate who understands their local laws better, we can connect them with whatever they need. And we will provide a hotline that is staffed by victim advocates during CAN accredited live events. So if something happens at a live event, there's a number they can call and give them their options for choosing the level of engagement that they would like to have in the restorative process that's right for them. So with these two different prongs here, you've got creators agreeing in advance to a certain standard of behavior and agreeing that if they violate it in certain ways that they will engage with us in the restorative approach to resolving these violations, they are giving us the ability to actually do something with the reports that the community members make we can actually focus on repairing the harm for the person who was impacted by it rather than like them having to speak out publicly and risk lawsuits while desperately trying to get enough people to care until the offender gets canceled by the community. Because up until now, those have been some of the only options. Right. Yeah. As, as, as became painfully obvious, as always after the fact, or as, as I should say, all too often after the fact. So if, if you would... You've spoken a lot about restorative justice here. For people who aren't familiar with the term or, or have just heard it in passing, can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? Like, what is restorative justice as opposed to just justice? So I want to push back a little bit on just the idea that there's like any such thing as just justice. Mm -hmm. Like there are a lot of different justice models. Like there's retributive justice, where the idea is that justice is served when the offender is harmed at least as much, if not more, than the person they harmed. So it's that kind of like trying to hurt somebody else to right. get vengeance a little bit. The two wrongs make a right approach. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> eye for an eye. 
So restorative justice is a more progressive justice model. It's one that focuses on repairing harm. So helping the person who was harmed rather than inflicting harm on somebody else. And it values the needs and outcomes of both parties or everyone involved. So it values everybody in the community, which includes the person who maybe caused the harm. So under our model, we would seek to identify and meet the needs of the person who's making the report and see, you know, what do they need? What could possibly reduce or repair the harm that they experienced? And then we would also want the person who is being reported to understand the impact of their behavior on that person. So engaging that empathy and that understanding, and then identify on the behalf of that person, what's the root cause of that behavior? Did they have a belief that the ends justified the means in that situation? Or was there a misunderstanding? Or were they not educated enough on a topic? Finding out the root cause of something makes it so that we can address and correct it and then find ways for them to help repair whatever harm that they cause. Right on. We can also ask where possible that creators like share any education that they receive so that others can benefit from it or not duplicate their mistakes. And that will also help the community be healthier as a result. So no part of that is about punishing anyone. And in fact, it prioritizes the well-being of both parties and seeks to repair relationships and trust and keep both parties in the community. Everyone benefits and the community at large also benefits. Wow. And they still accuse us of cancel culture. Okay. No, no, that's, that's awesome. I, I, I'm really excited to hear about the approach. I, I will say before I started talking with you guys about this whole thing, I wasn't familiar with the concept of restorative justice. And man, does that kick the shit out of the punitive version that most people think of as just default justice. So, okay, I want to shift gears here a little bit. In the aftermath of the whole situation in February, we as a company, we, we started looking into ways to outsource you know, sexual harassment complaints and the other kind of basic HR functions that we can't have because we're such a small company. And what we found is that there are actually a lot of options available for that, but they're all very much geared towards protecting the company and its legal liability, even if that is at the expense of a victim. So what assurances do our listeners have that can isn't going to turn into some like a similar cover your ass type thing? Sure. So first and foremost, I guess I would say as a nonprofit, there's no company for us to be beholden to. Mm -hmm. Our funding is coming from donors within the communities that we serve. And we are beholden only to our mission, which is to empower our communities to build trust with content creators through the systems of support and accountability that I mentioned before. Because we are interested in preventing harm and healing damage when it happens and educating and restoring relationships and just generally fostering healthier communities when we can, we don't usually have to make a binary choice to sacrifice either the concern for the person who is making the report or the you know well-being, livelihood, career of the person who's being reported. We don't have to choose who to harm versus who to help. We get to bring both to the table. And the end result is that creators are given a mechanism by which to genuinely, you know, repair harm if they have caused it, avoid causing it in the future. And community members' reports actually get to be addressed and can help the whole community be safer and help it be a lot more welcoming of a place for them. It's not to say that there are no red lines wherein we won't withdraw accreditation from somebody. Like there are, I think, obviously going to have to be hard lines where certain behaviors are considered to be too harmful or someone is a repeat offender. They are going through the restorative process, but then continuing to violate their code of conduct repeatedly. Things like that, where it becomes more obvious that this person is not really engaging in a restorative justice model. Right. Okay, so let's let's actually speak to that a little bit too, because for this to work, obviously, you need the cooperation of content creators. And as much as I'd love to say that their sense of self-preservation would never outweigh their obligation to community safety, the, the past strongly suggests otherwise, right? Now, I think you've already done this to a large degree here, but but for any of the content creators that might be listening along, give me your pitch. Like, why should they support and join the Creator Accountability Network? 
All right. So here are some of the ways that our restorative justice approach to accountability and conflict resolution will benefit creators as well as their communities. We provide a clear set of community-supported ethical standards and an accountability system to motivate creators to uphold those standards. It's easy to, you know, you're just living your life and you're just doing what you do. And sometimes you're, let's say, in a bad mood or not really thinking too hard about something. Signing up to uphold a code of conduct in and of itself motivates better behavior. Even if we generally think that our behavior is pretty good, simply codifying it, simply writing it down, simply stating, here's what I will and won't do, motivates better behavior. Mm -hmm. Likewise, unionizing or banding together around a set of standards exerts peer pressure on other creators who might not be naturally inclined to meet all those standards. So it raises the bar for safety and ethical behavior throughout our communities. It protects, and when I say it, I mean like our organization can protect creators from unsubstantiated accusations, witch hunts, or trial in the court of public opinion. You know, we have talked about the only way for people to get information out there so far is just to either access a whisper network and kind of pass things along in secret or post it in a Facebook group and hope enough people believe you, hope enough people are swayed, like information comes out little by little. You don't get to hear from the other side. People are making their minds up after seeing only half of the information. So this offers a great deal of protection to creators simply because that doesn't happen. Right. It provides a safe and constructive way to engage with feedback and address unethical behaviors in ways that promote honesty and self-reflection and education and the repairing of harm. I think that when we hurt somebody else and we realize it, like we would like to make it better. Sometimes the way that things come out makes it pretty hard to do that. We help make their communities safer and more welcoming, which makes it easier for creators to connect with and grow their audiences. Mm -hmm. We provide resources for networking with other creators and organizations who share that commitment to ethical behavior. So for instance, some organizations are very interested in finding out what creators do we recommend? What creators do we support? Sure. There's increased visibility and engagement with new audience members who are looking to support creators who share their values. Um, you know, and I just want to say, like, signing on with us, it's not saying you're perfect. It's saying that if you fall short of your ideals, you would like to know about it and make it right. It's a commitment to your audiences and your community members that if and when you make mistakes, you want those people to have somewhere safe that they can go to for help getting it addressed. And it's not going to turn around and bite you. It's going to help you. Well said. Wow. Uh, <laughs> like I said, I thought, you know, I was like, well, you know, she's already addressed plenty of points on this. I, there's probably not much left to say. And boy, was I wrong. All right. So I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here. Obviously, there are a, there's a lot. You guys are biting off a lot already. But what are the long terms for CAN? What, wh where do you see the organization going in the future? So we have some services that we intend to offer over time. We don't want to bite off more than we can chew, but we have lofty goals and aspirations for the future. I think our, our first one is that we would like to have a 24-7 reporting hotline year round. We need more victim advocates to make that a reality, but that's a goal at the moment. We'd like to offer voluntary training and consulting and education materials. We've already had some organizations asking us for these things. We just don't want to get too big too fast. We want to get our feet under us before we start branching out. We would like to establish a victim defense fund so that if we have people who are victims of significant harm from our creators, we are able to help fund, like, do they have legal needs? Do they have mental health care costs? We'd like to have something available to help people. Mm -hmm. We would also like to have grants to fund projects by minority and marginalized creators. When we think about who usually gets impacted by 
a lot of the harm that happens in communities like this, it tends to be minority and marginalized people. So we kind of feel like giving back to creators who might be more likely to experience harm or more likely to experience roadblocks and difficulties in growing their careers. Offering grants is one way to kind of help channel community funds to people who might need more support. Mm -hmm. And then service work and other restorative approaches to promoting ethical conduct in our communities. We've talked about creating a lot of different educational materials, even textbooks, things like that. But we'd like to get into some service work as well. That's awesome. All right. Well, so obviously, we all know the two things that a charity needs first and foremost, that is time and money. Now, I know a lot of our listeners, when we first started talking about this back in February, expressed a desire to help this effort. How, how can they help now? Well, if you're interested in volunteering, we strongly encourage you to complete the form on our website, creatoraccountabilitynetwork.org. There's a form there that you can fill out that specifies our volunteering needs. We have a special need for folks who have interest or experience in victim advocacy if you are certified already or if you're willing to become certified. So to take a training and then come back and volunteer with us or if you have a background in social work, those things will be all helpful on the victim advocacy team. If you have a background in investigation, especially if you have a restorative justice background, but if you don't, that's okay. We can work with you but we need folks who've got that experience or education or just background in investigation. Mediation, again, especially with restorative justice or mindfulness backgrounds. Totally separate from those things, database construction, management, and security. Oh, interesting. Yeah, of course. Yep. And then public relations and community engagement. So I'm kind of our PR person at the moment. and You're nailing it, by the way. I just want to say on behalf of everybody listening, so far, so good. Thank you so much. Well, okay, then I would like to hire anybody who just thinks they can do as good a job as me. There you go. And then uh, anybody who's got any experience in nonprofit leadership, management of any kind, we're just looking for people who have resources or education or experience that we can contribute to our pool. But if you don't have those things, don't let that stop you. Like, please come sign the volunteer list for us. And you just never know where we'll find a spot. We may need help on the ethics team. Uh, we may need help with just research. But we're, we're, we're expanding a lot. We were small in the beginning. Mm-hmm. We've got room for more now. So come sign up and we'll find a place for you. All right. And what about those of us who um, might not have any useful skills whatsoever and certainly <laughs> don't have any free time, but still want to help? Are you already a 501c3? Can, can you take donations? So we're a 501c3 pending, and it will probably be about six to eight months before the IRS gives us their little stamp of approval. Mm-hmm. But we can take donations, but because we have to process them manually, we're currently just asking for large contributions. So our treasurer said minimum, like a a one-time contribution, like one-time gifts, maybe $5,000 or up. If you want to do recurring monthly, like $750 per month, those smaller ones, like people wanting to donate just a little bit would probably get overwhelming because he has to put them all in manually, like one at a time. Right. So we're just trying to, uh, what, what does he have to do? He has to like, Get the right to fundraise in all 50 states. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, no. I, in a very specific way. <laughs> well, you know what? That's one of those things where like if you're, if you've been in the atheist community for a long time, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm glad there's red tape on this kind of <laughs> shit, right? You know, so, so, okay. So you're looking for volunteers more than money unless you, unless you're loaded. That's fine. That's fine. So every little bit doesn't help just yet. It will help soon. We will desperately need donations at a certain point. We just also don't have the infrastructure to mm-hmm. take them all yet. <laughs> Well, and and I should I should let the listeners know that I've been so eager to tell some. Now I'm not. I I I want to say I'm not directly involved in any of this. Um, I I was 
nominally involved in helping to introduce a few people at the beginning that that eventually became part of the working group that created this. Because of sort of my position vis-a-vis all the stuff that happened in February, I think we all agreed it was better if I stayed at arm's length. But I, I have been really following along. I've been really excited and I've been really wanting to tell our listeners what's going on. So I, I may have pushed Sarah to be here a little earlier than the, uh, than the organization wanted to sort of make that first uh, big public splash. So if you're wondering why that is, I'm sure that factors into it a little bit. No, honestly, this was perfect. Um, This is the exact moment that we were finally able to be a little bit more public. And we needed those volunteers so, so badly. This was the perfect time to do this. And especially to boost the volunteer request, we need people on deck. Excellent. Well, I'll tell you what, our listeners have never disappointed us when we've asked them for something like this. They have never disappointed. So I'm sure they'll be rushing to creatoraccountabilitynetwork.org. We'll have that linked in the show notes, of course, for our listeners. Sarah, thanks again for your time. Thank you so much, Noah.